How many times in life are we forced to ask ourselves this question? Why do I need to go through this? Or why does life have to happen this way? Anyone ever ask yourself this question? These questions can be prompted by anything, really. Maybe a loss of job, mundaneness of a job, an illness, a disease. We ask ourselves, why do I have to go through this? Maybe it's about family, career, relationships, or just life's well-being. How many here have ever had a relationship, sadly, break down? How many have not had the results from the hard work that you've put into? Maybe you've sat waiting for some type of direction in life. Maybe you've been extremely annoyed with someone who seems to be making every effort to deter you from what you are trying to do. Maybe you've been put in a situation where you feel or you believe you did not deserve to be in. Anyone ever been in these type of situations? Maybe we all might be able to raise our hand for one of those, maybe more. But these mentioned are the same situations that Paul is going through in these passages of Scripture, or that he's went through in this section in the book of Acts. So as we read these, or as we read these sections, or this passage of Scripture, think about what was it that helped Paul get through all of these life experiences. And then we look at how Paul got through these life experiences, we might be able to then think, how can we get through similar life experiences? We're going to go ahead and look again into the passage in Acts. But I thank you for reading Acts chapter 16. I would like to draw our attention just to the paragraph prior to Acts 16. Because as we come into this chapter of Acts 16, we can remember that in chapter 15, there was a big meeting or a council in Jerusalem. They were confirming the truth that salvation is by faith and is through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's with this message that Paul is wanting to go now to proclaim it, to preach it to the world, to fulfill his calling. But at the end of chapter 15, we see there's a slight problem. Paul's lifelong friend, or his ministry partner, wants to take a person named John Mark with him. But Paul didn't feel John Mark was ready. Because before, John Mark deserted them and when they went on the journey. And we read in verse 39, they had such a sharp disagreement, they parted company. So Barnabas takes John Mark and went to Cyprus, and Paul chooses Silas, and they go to Syria. Now, as we begin chapter 16, Paul has just now recently parted company with Barnabas. He has Silas is with him, and they're going from town to town preaching the gospel, preaching the good news as discussed in chapter 15. Salvation is by faith through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we see here some positives. The church is growing. And this is all good. And we see and we find in Acts 15 verse 36 and then through into Acts 16, we get here that the church is growing. And so now when we get to verse 6, if you look in your passage, we read that Paul is traveling through the region here, but he's actually kept from going to where he wants to go. The passage tells us the Holy Spirit kept them from preaching the word in the providence or in the province of Asia. And so just look at the situation going on here. Paul has a falling out with his friend, his long companion. He has a new person with him, and he begins this mission. We see growth, and so there's positives. But now Paul is not able to go where he wants to go. He's being kept from preaching where he wants to preach. Now, just in these few situations, in these life experiences, they seem quite relatable. Maybe they, should, they do to me. How many of us, we, we deal with relationship breakdowns? We have a friendship that has gone down. 
Or we feel the frustration of not being able to do what we feel is right to do or what we want to do. Something that we feel is important and we're held from it. But still, we see positives happen. Now, these are, doesn't that feel like life? We have so many issues, yet we so see good. We have struggles, yet we see fruit. You know, it's, it's, it's like, it's really life situation. And so Paul is trying to go about and do his work. I'm sure there's some frustrations deep within himself as he goes about it. He wasn't able to go towards Asia as he wanted. And now he makes his way towards this place called Troas. And it's here he has this vision of a man from Macedonia calling him. So immediately the next morning, they set out towards that area. And we read in verse 11 in your scriptures, it tells us they set sail towards the area and they end up in this place called Philippi. It's a Roman colony. It's the leading city of that district of Macedonia, and they are there several days. Now, if you could put yourself in the shoes of Paul and now Silas, how would you be feeling at this point? Through all the situations that you've gone through, you've had a relationship breakdown, you have a new person here for, to do this mission, You've had some residual frustration, but also there's some mental relief that now we're headed somewhere. We have a plan. We have a goal. We have a vision. And we, we fed, we, we've set out, and we feel we have a purpose now and a plan. It's like it was going, and it was annoying, but now I've got focus. I'm going. I can do this. But here we are in Philippi. They're there several days. And then we come to verse 13. It's the Sabbath day. So they make their way to find this place of prayer. Now it's unclear whether the women were already there gathered at the place of prayer, or they meet them gathering at the river while they're on their way to this place of prayer. It seems that most likely in this area, there is a small number of Jewish people. There wasn't enough to have a synagogue. So they appointed places to meet, and that is where Paul is headed. But in doing this, they come along this gathering, across this gathering of women who are there. And from these women, we're introduced to this person called Lydia. She's described as a seller of purple, which seems to be someone who works in fine cloth for very wealthy. It's a good money maker. It seems that Lydia was not only wealthy, but also she was Religious, We see here this message when the gospel is given to her. She's in God fear. But then Paul tells him that the Lord opened her heart to respond to the message of the gospel or the good news of Jesus. And then we're told here that she and the members of her household are then baptized. And she opens her home to Paul for them all to stay there. And thus we have our first converts in this leading city in the district of Macedonia in this place called Philippi. Now, how do you think Paul must be feeling at this point? I mean, he must be buzzing. You know, I mean, this is great. This is, oh, it's exciting. You know, things are going. Imagine if he's sending back a letter like, you would not believe what happened through all the frustrations, through all the difficulties. Lydia in her whole household, and she's given us a place to stay. He must be buzzing. They must, yes, still feel a little bit frustrated, you know, as to what happened. But now we have a family, and we can start this Christian community here in this town called Philippi. Now, as a side note, we learn that the let these people in Philippi through the letter of Philippians, Paul has a deep affection for these people. He has a deep sense of love towards this community of believers. This church were major helpers for him financially through his mission, and the women there were key roles to his ministry. But the events continue on. We carry on. These conversions must have motivated Paul, so they carry on. They, they, they're, uh, to go elsewhere, to carry on and finding ways to preach the salvation that Jesus of Jesus to these people. And so we come here to verse 16 and the following verses. One day, 
they're making their way to this place of prayer where they're met by this female slave who began to harass them verbally. She follows them around, proclaiming, these men are servants of the Most High God. They are telling you the way to be saved. Now, put yourself in Paul's situation again. How would you be feeling in this situation? Well, how, how would you feel? This is going on for several days, it says. Now, at first, you might think, okay, well, you know, this is saving me some time. I don't have to tell anybody what I'm here to do. I just let her say it, and I'll carry on with, this, with my, my, my message. Almost like an introduction. But in other ways, you would begin to feel extremely annoyed. You know, like, kind of like a child constantly asking you questions. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? What are we doing? What are you doing? What's for dinner? What's for dinner? All these things constantly. And so, like a natural person, Paul becomes extremely annoyed. And we read in verse 18. It says, finally, he became so annoyed, he commanded the spirit to come out of her, and it did. Whew. What a relief, right? It's like, I can totally imagine the feeling. It stopped. It's like when there's a car alarm going off outside your house on the road. And then there's a little bit of relief. Something that eats at you and it's gone. There's some relief. Well, the relief didn't last long. Because what happened is the owners now of this female slave realized that their hope for making money was gone. So they came after Paul and Silas. They seized them. They dragged them into the marketplace to the local governments and said, These men are Jews and they're throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs that are unlawful for Romans to accept or to practice. Now, hopefully you see what I'm trying to do. How would you be feeling if you were Paul in this situation now? Not yet. Everything was going so well, and now what's happening again? The church seemed to be doing well, and now I've been seized. Now, the interesting thing about this event was the owners here, they're upset because it affected their livelihood, and that's why they made such a fuss. As one person has pointed out, the Roman pride here is the focal point. Their, their pride was challenged. The, this charge as, is, as against them is they are trying to get Romans to do what they don't normally do. And this is a serious charge especially towards someone who seems to be a foreigner, who seems to be a non-Roman citizen, which at this point they are unaware of Paul's citizenship status. And so these people are jumping to conclusions about who Paul is, and they seize him, and these slave owners in the local government are making an ethnic and a religious issue. These foreigners are making us adapt to their religion, and they're not even Roman. As one writes, the charge is that Paul is encouraging Romans to become Christian and their new loyalties will direct them away from Caesar and faithful citizenship to Rome since Christians don't worship the emperor as the Roman law insists. And so what do they do? They grab Paul and Silas and they beat them, which is unlawful to whip and beat a Roman citizen, and they put them in prison, deep into a cell, and they are now in a place, in a situation, that they, by law, do not deserve to be. So, you're Paul, you're Silas. How are you feeling at this point? Injustice. This is not right. He has a new mission partner. From because of a broken relationship. He's in a new town, a new community of Christians. He's now been in jail. He's treated as if he's not even a citizen of Rome. Now, if it was me, I would be fuming. I would be so upset. But what do we see here? What does Paul and Silas do? Verse 25. Paul and Silas turned to prayer 
and sing. Now, how many can raise your hand and say, that's what I would be doing? You know, my hand's way down, sitting on my hand. I definitely would not be doing it. But let's think about it. Here's the thing. Why do you think, just take like two seconds and think, why do you think they turn to prayer and song at this point? Just take a moment and think about this. If you have any history of the book of Acts, just think. Why is it that they turn to prayer and song at this point? Just pause for just a moment and think on that. Now, this idea of prayer is not a new concept to the early church. Now, in fact, it's just the opposite. Prayer was a major building block for the new church and how it was formed and how it grows. If you can remember, in Acts chapter 2, what happens in Acts chapter 2? You have Pentecost. What did, in, in Acts 2, verse 42, after the church here, we have all these people added to the church. What does it say in verse 42? It says this, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship with each other, to the breaking of bread, which is the Lord's table, and to prayer. So these were people who had devoted themselves, a committed thing to do, to hear the teaching, fellowship with the believers, remember the Lord's death, and to pray. So prayer was one of the top things of priority in the early church. It was a building block. It was a major aspect of the life of the church. And we can see it not only in the beginning, but throughout the book of Acts. In chapter 4, verse 23, after Peter and John, they were released from the custody and they went back to their own people. And what do you think they did? We are told they raised their voices together in prayer to God because an answer was given. In chapter 7, you know the story, you might know the story. Stephen is being stoned. And while he is dying, what does he do? He prays. And maybe you might remember who was actually in the vicinity of Stephen's death. There was a man at the time called Saul, who later would become Paul. Paul there sees an example of someone in grief, dying, lifting up prayer, and actually lifting up a prayer to forgive the sins of those who he was persecuting him. We come to Acts chapter 10. And when the Lord came to Peter about going to visit Cornelius, when the Lord visits Paul, or Peter, what was Peter doing? He was in his time of prayer. He was praying, and the Lord visits him to give him direction, to give him um, this, this uh, the intentions of where he should go. We come to Acts chapter 12. Peter now is in jail. What was the church doing? When Peter then was rescued by the angel from prison and he goes to the church, what was the church still doing? You can answer if you want to. They're praying. Yeah, come on, come on. You can do. These are all easy answers now. It's going to be the same thing. We get to Acts chapter 13. Before the church sends out Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey, what did the church do? <coughs> They fasted. And so by the time we get to Acts chapter 16, we already know that prayer is something of the utmost importance. So it should be no surprise when we get to Acts 16 and verse 13, when Paul and the others arrived in Philippi, what was one of the first things they did? They went searching for the place of prayer. We then get to verse 16. When this female slave comes out to harass them, where were they going in this point? They were going to the place of prayer. 
What do you think I'm getting at here? I'm trying to show that prayer isn't just the means when we are in a desperate situation. I mean, yes, prayer is, we should pray. Peter did that when he's sinking. Lord, help. There's an idea of prayer in desperation. But prayer isn't just for when things are going bad. Prayer is that time with God. It's that time when we come together with other people and bring the events of our lives before our Lord. Prayer is the foundational building block of the church. It was then, and I believe it still should be, and is today. When we began today thinking about what helped Paul get through his life experiences, and how can we get through our life experiences. As we look at this passage and we look through the book of Acts, we come to Paul's life. And what would make him ask, why do I have to go through this? Why do we have to have disagreements and split? Why do I have to have this falling out? Why, why didn't I get to go to where I wanted to go? Why does it take several days to find people to listen to the message of Christ? We have a breakthrough. All is going well. The excitement doesn't last long. And then there's someone who makes life difficult. And he can think, why does this person show up in my life to put a stick in the bicycle spoke, as it were, and flip life all around? And then he ends up in jail. And he might be thinking, why? Why did I get annoyed and respond this way? What could I have done differently? And now I'm in jail, and actually I'm in jail, and I shouldn't be, because they beat me, and they're not allowed. And as we look at this passage today, I think we can learn this. How do we get through all of life experiences? How do we get through the normal things of life? A major event, a birth of a child, a new job. How do we get through life when our team is winning? Maybe our is losing. How do we get through the unforeseeable situations in life? The joys, the sorrows, the anxieties, the broken relationships, the answers to prayers. All of life's situations. How do we get through that? I hope today you can see the importance of the personal relationship that we can have with God. I hope that we can see the importance of the personal relationship with our church people through prayer. Time and time again, we see in the book of Acts, the church gathered together for prayer. They prayed to rejoice of an answered prayer. They prayed when someone was in need. They prayed for others when they were being persecuted. They prayed before they set out to do something. They pray in times of crises. So my challenge today is this. And I'm speaking to myself as well. Why is it that I only pray when I'm desperate? Why do you only pray when you're desperate? Do we see the importance of this personal, ongoing relationship with our Savior through the good, through the bad? As a church... Do we see the importance of it is as when we are gathered together and the Spirit is in the midst, that personal relationship that we have during the good, during the bad, during even the indifferent. We need to make our time of prayer an important aspect of our life. It should be an important aspect of the life of the church. We have the example of Jesus. He prayed all the time. He prayed in times of blessing. He prays in times of sorrow. He even prayed and didn't get the right answer that he felt or that he wanted. Let the cup pass from me. It didn't pass. Yet not my will, but yours. The joy of being a believer is that we have been given the Spirit of Christ within us. This Spirit is Christ. And he says, We're, we are gathered together. I am in the midst. And so when we come together with ourselves in God, we are speaking with God, showing our continual dependence upon Him. When we come together with other people as a church, 
we are still speaking to the same God, showing our corporate dependence upon Him because we need Him. And this dependence on God through prayer is what helps build and mold the church. Now, we know the rest of the story in Acts 16. I didn't have it read. If you want to know the rest of the story, go ahead and read it this afternoon. The earthquakes. It shook the jail. And through this event, we have our second household into the Christian community there in the city of Philippi. A church is formed, and it becomes a very special place for the Apostle Paul. A community that he deeply, deeply cared for. And so what I would challenge us today is let's make prayer a priority in our life. Not just when we're desperate, but in every aspect of our life. Pray on your own. Pray with people in your church. Pray to the Lord as he is willing.